Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Anya Leonard. I am the founder and director of Classical Wisdom. Uh, if you're new to Classical Wisdom, we are a site dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. And I'm very excited today to have a very interesting conversation on the nature of the gods. Um, and I think this is a it's a really, really important conversation. And I I feel like I'm a bit repetitive because I, I know my audience well enough to, to know that I probably don't need to say this. But just in case, I would love to say that uh, everyone, please come in with the spirit of open mindedness. Uh, we're off in the quest of truth and inquiry. And that means no topic is off the, the, the table. Um, and I'm actually going to quote uh, Cicero from the George's excellent translation on the nature of gods when he says, my intention is to be a fair and unbiased listener. I am not at all constrained by some knee jerk reflective duty to endorse a predetermined view. So uh, I think that will be an excellent spirit in which to enter this no doubt fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm going to first uh, introduce our esteemed guests, um, and then they will start off the conversation and we will be taking questions throughout in the chat. Um, and we will have a dedicated Q&A near the end. So to begin, uh, Michael Fontaine is the professor and associate vice professor of undergraduate education at the Department of Classics at Cornell University, New York, and the author of many books and articles. He has contributed to countless publications, including Forbes, The Spectator, The Daily Beast, The Times Literary Supplement, The Daily Mail, The Wine Spectator. He's the author of several publications, such as How to Tell a Joke, Pig Wars, How to Drink, The Classical Guide of Inbiting, as well as How to Grieve, An Ancient Guide to the Lost Art, and has been a regular in the Classical Wisdom uh, events. So um, we, we always enjoy having uh, Mike here with us. And we're also very happy to have, as a newcomer to Classical Wisdom, uh, George Thomas, who's also Quintus Curtius and the translator of the most uh, this excellent, very readable, very enjoyable translation on the nature of gods. And this is an excellent work. I highly recommend it's just released. Um, but I'm going to let I'm going to turn over to Mike and he is going to do a more proper introduction to George and I will get out of you. Thank you very much, Anya. And hi, everybody. It's great to, to do another event here with Classical Wisdom. It's a real, real pleasure for me to introduce our translator for you today. And I want to give you a little bit of background. So I'm a professor of classics. That's the day job. I've been doing this a long time. And back around 2015, 16, somewhere around there, somebody said, have you heard there's some guy out there translating Cicero all by himself? He's not uh, He's not an academic. We don't really know anything about it. He's got some pseudonym. And so I was given the mandate to go check this stuff out and see what's going on. But lo and behold, I found my way to George Thomas, who's with us today. What I've since learned is that George went to MIT as an undergraduate and was then an officer in uh, the Marine Corps for a number of years. Since then, he's gone on to become a trial attorney, and that's what he does as his own day job. Uh, and I think actually that has a lot to do, uh, a very significant amount to do with the success of his project. But uh, somehow during the day, he finds time to translate Latin, classical Latin, into magnificent English prose. He is, I think, without any hesitation, the best translator we have in the English-speaking world today for this stuff. Um, he has sort of led the Cicero revolution, taking Cicero as a serious thinker um, in his ethics and his philosophy and his commitment to patriotism and political commitments. And, uh, you know, that's for me, it was, it was a real surprise because when I got to grad school way back when, everybody said, oh, don't read Cicero. His philosophy is derivative and he doesn't really have anything new to say. And so, you know, when everybody you know who's older than you tells you that, you just say, okay, I guess that's true. Uh, but it's totally wrong. So I, I have since become a huge apostle for George's translations. He's done, uh, most influentially, I think, the on duties of Cicero, which is great. I've been teaching it in classes here for many years now. Uh, last year or a year before, I think it was the Tusculan Disputations, which is Cicero's guide to mental health and how to get a grip and prioritize, you know, what's most important to you in life. He's done uh, a number of other works by Cicero. He's also done Sallust. He's done Cornelius Nepos and so on. These are all fantastic books. Um, and so that's my intro for you, George. And before I let you speak, I want to give a little tiny bit uh, of background about today's latest work. It's brand new on the nature of the gods. 
Uh, and so this is a book uh, whose title might right away make you think of Lucretius, if you've ever heard of On the Nature of Things. And that's going to be one of the contrasts Cicero might have had in mind. You know, what's the difference between a thing and a god? Cicero wrote this book uh, toward the very end of his life in the year 45, when he was um, probably 60 something years old. As George puts it quite memorably in the introduction here, he was a hunted man. Cicero had been, as you may know, uh, the the most important guy in Rome in his day. He had sort of saved Roman society from a coup attempt, only to find, as Nepos could tell you, that the whole country turned against him. He was shamed into exile and so on. In the final years of his life, he wrote all this philosophy. And this particular book, he tackles the topic of the nature of the gods. What are the gods? Do they exist? And so on. So, George, a first question I'm going to ask you, I guess, uh, is what this you know, what is the book about? How is it set up? But also, even before we get to that, I bet we're going to have some people on this call that say the gods. Well, I don't believe in a bunch of polytheistic gods. I don't even know if I believe in God at all. Why would I read some theological stuff? Is this going to be a sermon batting me over the head, telling me how to live my life? Is that what the book is about? Or can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, first, uh, Michael, let me say thank you for your very, very kind uh introductory remarks I, I do appreciate it and um it's uh, I'm very happy to be here and to hopefully i can contribute to uh, you and uh anya's discussion here but regarding the nature of the gods uh, a little bit about it it's it, it's a, like many of uh, cicero's philosophical works it's it's set up in dialogue form which is a, a format he was comfortable with as as a from the academic school with his uh, platonic influence um, and it's basically it's it's a it's a, a dialogue in three books, and it, it really deals with four basic subject uh, categories. You know, the, it, it does a short review of um, early Greek philosophy and, and the, the the views of early Greek natural philosophers on the nature of the of the world and the cosmos, and then it has um, in, in the first book it it, it got deals with the uh, the Epicurean uh, theological views, and then it discusses the Stoic uh, theological views on the nature of the God. And then finally, it, it um, ha offers a critique of both of those systems from the perspective of academic skepticism. And there's, there's a number of different interlocutors or, or speakers. I, I can talk about them if you, if you think it's appropriate for me to do that. Um, but uh, essentially, it's it's a, it's a very relaxed. Uh, anyone that's been to the Italian countryside can almost imagine this happening. It's uh, Cicero is present during the dialogue, but he doesn't really take an active uh, participatory particip participatory role in it. Uh, it's held at the house uh, or the villa of a gentleman uh, named uh, Caius Aurelius Cotta, C O T T A. He was an actual person. Uh, and he was a, a man, a Roman politician and orator who's about 18 years older than Cicero. Um, he served as a consul and also a, um, uh, a pontiff, uh, but he's referred to as a pontiff in the dialogue. And from that, we can sort of give an estimate of the date of this imaginary dialogue. And there's two other speakers. There's uh, an individual named Caius uh, Veleus, Veleus, B E I L L. Uh, -E -L -L -E -I -U -S, uh, and he offers the uh, Epicurean critique or the Epicurean uh, view of the nature of the gods. And then there's a, a gentleman named um, Balbus, uh, I believe it's uh, Quintus Lucilius Balbus. I can look it up, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the name. And, and, and we, we know very little about these individuals. It, they apparently were real people, as far as we know. But uh, we don't know really anything about them other than what we find in the in the text itself. Um, can I, can yes, I ask you, so I just it it almost sounds like a joke, doesn't it, George? So you have an Epicurean, a Stoic, <laughs> and a skeptic walk into a Roman villa, <laughs> and so yeah. you know you said it's a dialogue. It is a dialogue, but I think a lot of us on this call are going to think of Socratic dialogues with a lot of give and take, like a Greek tragedy. But that's not really how it reads to me. And I wonder if you would agree with this idea that it seems more like a lawyer's brief. You know, the Epicurean makes the best possible case, and then the Stoic immediately cross-examines that 
and just blows it to smithereens. And what's interesting for a lot of people here are going to be that in the third book, the Stoics are in the hot seat and they finally have their ideas questioned. Do you do you think that's right? Or I, I, I think it's a very great point, Michael. I, I think um, in many ways you could almost look upon this as three independent monologues rather than a dialogue. You've got one sort of stream of information from one perspective, one from another and a third from another. I mean, Epicureanism, Stoicism, um, at, you know, academicism, uh, the Aristotelians were not really as popular as a school, but these were the three major schools in Cicero's day. So it was natural for him to treat these uh, these philosophical perspectives. And, you know, how he set up uh, this dialogue, it's a lot less back and forth-ish, for lack of a better word, than, say, Tusculan Disputations is or, or even uh, um, on moral ends. And there are, we could argue or we can maybe debate the reasons for that. It, it may have been that Cicero just preferred it that way and felt that was more conducive to getting his point across. Or it may have been that he really did not have time to revise the manuscript and polish it to a, a more complete form. We, we really don't know. Um, but I, I don't I, I think it works. I, I think probably in a subject like this to have constant interruptions like um, well, wait a minute. What do you what do you say? What do you mean? No, how dare you say that? And then have a back and forth. It might detract a little bit from the flow of the dialogue, but it's it's debatable. But yes, it is. Um, it, it's it's very um, as you said. It's uh, th there is some scorching criticism and and uh, and uh, relentless hounding of certain perspectives that we find in in the dialogue, which is in keeping with. Cicero's style of engagement. I want to ask you about one in particular, and I couldn't dismiss the thought from my head. And those of you on the call, tell us in the chat if you've ever heard this before. But my takeaway from book two uh, is that this is the best summation of, of Stoic sort of physics and metaphysics, right? Uh, and a lot of us are familiar with the coping mechanisms that we get in Tusculan Disputations. If you're angry, if you're upset, you know. But here, boy, you start reading the Stoic stuff, the most uh, impressive, for lack of a better word, um, thing that comes across is their ardent belief in intelligent design. I haven't heard that term in a good 10 or 15 years, but it was a real culture war thing here. Uh, what, 20 years back under the yeah. Bush and we kept hearing about it. And they wanted to ban teaching that and everything as being religious. But here it is a stoic point of view. And the argument is going on at great length about how hands are clearly, you know, they're here to help yeah. us. So, Even the stars, the planets, and the firmament, it's all, you know, was perfectly created uh, for as evidence of intelligence and it's a live, the world is living. Yeah, it's a very good point, Michael. I mean, we, we just don't, you know, just by an accident of history, we don't have the original writings of Zeno, of Kidium. We don't have Chrysippus. We don't have Carneades. We have to really infer, you know, early Stoic uh, thought from mainly from Cicero, as far as we know, this is the most complete statement of ancient theologies that, that it, it really has really come down to us. Now, that's not the only value of the book, but it, it is it is a repository of, of otherwise lost information. And, and, and just as you said, yes, there's um, this concept of, of, I mean, I guess we'll talk about divine providence down the road, but, um, you know, Actually. we... Talk yeah. about that now, right? Because yeah, well, you know, and it's a good. We we've talked about this before. You know, Stoicism has enjoyed a sort of a, a real renaissance popularity in recent years. But you find that most of the people that really investigate the Stoic philosophy, they um, they tend to really focus on ethics and and neglect the physics and metaphysics of Stoicism, which are, in my view, I think just as interesting, and present some real, I think, some real challenges in terms of um you know cultural diffusion and uh, at least at least in, in, my, in my view i guess we, we can get to that in, in a minute but um you know the stoics had a very ad ad advanced cosmology of, of we can agree with it or disagree with it but it, it certainly is there and uh you know the frequently you know uh, the this whole idea of divine providence is a, is a major feature of of the treaties and you know we've talked about this, Michael. You know, what what does it mean? Well, divine providence. What, what is that? Well, it's it's this idea of a prescient, prescient, what, super what, superintending, um, you know, superintending uh, governance, uh, 
of the world or of the universe. It, it's the idea, basically it's divine governance with, with elements of prescience in it. And it really stems from the, the Stoic view that, you know, the human soul is an emanation of a, of a, an original creative uh, divine architect. And we, we can have, you know, we, that being the case, we, we have, uh, that that seems to suggest to the Stoic thinkers that we can have a uh, we can sort of know or divine the um, the intent and 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 will of a of a divine power and this this they also this is where divination and uh, ties into their belief that that kind of gets us into different areas but um, the Stoics were also a big big believers in in, in divination um, the idea that we can use augurs and auguries and uh, power speak you know but uh, that's that's a, a very fascinating subject in itself and um i personally i find it very interesting that cicero took the view that uh look he he served as an augur himself in his early career he that was a, a post that he held i think he was fascinated by these things um but he uh, certainly and in, in cicero's treatise on divination talked about this and he also touches on it in uh, on the republic the republica uh, he scorned divination, basically. He thought that it was nonsense. However, and this is where it gets very, very interesting, and this is, shows his real sophistication as a political thinker, he still thought that it should be uh, supported. He still thought that it should be respected because it was written into the Roman Constitution. The, the, um, the use of augurs and, um, and, and, and uh, these types of... Uh, fortune tellers, for lack of a better word. It was written into the Roman Constitution, and, and Cicero thought that um, the law should be respected, and that these uh, the respect for these institutions would serve as a check on the excesses of, uh, of democracy. So you might say this is a very cynical view of, of religion, but uh, it, it was one that that's, that's shared by many great uh, thinkers and political figures in history. I think it's uh, we we can find analogies in, in many philosophers, even in in um, a leader, say someone like Napoleon, who was certainly not a religious man himself, but he uh, understood the importance of restoring the Catholic Church to its former prominence in in France after the um, the excesses of the revolution. So again, this is getting us into different areas, but it's possible to believe in the importance of religious ritual and yet not actually believe literally in the rituals themselves. And this is a, a contradiction that many people find um, disconcerting. I want to ask I you about that, if, if I can, because book one is all about um, the Epicureans, what they have to say about the gods. And some people here with us may already know this, but Epicurus famously said, the gods exist. They just don't have anything to do with us. And people say, wait a minute, that's it. Like, that, that doesn't sound very sincere. That sounds like you're trying not to get burned at the stake. And he never actually answered that on the record. But Cicero, so you would think what you just said, right? I mean, a person like me might think Cicero has some sympathy for Epicureanism. But as you and I have talked about it, he seems adamant that this is a destructive philosophy, that it's not a good thing for Romans to practice Epicureanism. And what are your thoughts on that based on here or other things you've written and translated? I, I, absolutely, Michael. I, I I think I think Cicero viewed uh, well. First of all, let's say that Cicero's critique of Epicureanism uh, is valid in some points, but he also I think is is unfair in in other. It often does not show him at his best. I think he was correct in believing that their ethical system lent itself to abuses, uh, but I think he he unfortunately does misrepresent. Uh, the atomic uh, theories of the Epicureans, I, I think he he completely dismisses it, which I think does not show him at his best. But his view of the, the the Epicurean theology was that was basically that look, your idea, the Epicurean idea of a god, where you've got this vague nebulous god that sort of emanates atoms uh, from films. It, it's so vague and it's so nebulous and so. Um, detached that it's really no God at all. And he he basically wanted to say, look, just come out and say what you really think. We all know that you're materialists. We all know that you Epicureans are, you think there's nothing out there except atoms in the void. Your only 
presenting this um, eological exercise as a as a protective coloration to prevent yourselves from getting uh, driven out of uh, Athens or or wherever. We all know what you really want. Yeah. And look, there, there's some there. I think there is some there's some validity to this criticism. Um, so, you know, but it's a it's a mixed bag. I mean, Cicero, I think, like anyone, he was he was not perfect. He had some very um, some of his criticisms of Epicureanism is 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 ferocious and slashing. Um, but I I think. All in all, I think his primary concerns were for social order. I think that's how we, we really have to understand him as a as a, a a political figure who was very much concerned with respect for the law and social order. And I think he felt that um, the Epicureanism, Epicurean theology, essentially destroyed all all faith in the gods because it, it um, if we accept the atomic theory, then what do we have? We have basically nothing. You know, that's interesting you say that, um, uh, especially that last part, right? Because as I understand it, you know, Epicureanism is basically the secular humanist lifestyle today, right? I mean, this is what was sort of rediscovered in the Renaissance, more or less as described in um, Stephen Greenblatt's book, The Swerve, the, you know, the rediscovery of Lucretius. And when people started, they got the microscopes, they said the atomic theory makes better sense than some of these other ideas of where stuff is coming from. Uh but the, the straight materialism doesn't get us from inert matter to anything alive, does it? Right? And that's where book two of On the Nature of the Gods is so fascinating because it tries to restore that. The Stoic tries to restore your sense of wonder in how things are actually alive. And I have to share a funny story. Uh, you know, I live in a university town. There's not so many of us here. And I was out. Um, it's funny, on our local ski lift a few years ago with a planetary scientist. Wow. And I said, you know, I, you know, all the science is great, but nobody really knows where life come from, comes from. He said, oh, that's not so hard. I said, oh, really? Okay. He said, okay. It cycles, cycles of heat and cold, they contract, they condense, and they generate life. I said, do you really believe that? Like, really? I mean, has that ever actually been done before? And this guy, he already had it all figured out. So <laughs> to wow. go, book two is really trying to say, you know, that, that we could all be atoms in the void, but how are we thinking and moving? And how am I moving my fingers? I'm not even aware I'm doing this, right? Um, yeah. Me, based on your lawyer's experience, what would it mean to have the first philosophy, basically the atheist philosophy, present its view, and then cross-examined by the second philosophy, Stoicism, and then the third philosophy, skepticism, cross-examined, but nobody cross-examined skepticism. What would that mean to you if you did this? Oh, in man. Well, I mean, the big danger there would be they would all be talking past each other. I guess, yeah, you know, it, it's um. You know these these types of um, th these types of debate. I mean, look, there, there's there's different schools of thought. There are some people that think that theological discussions like this um, ultimately don't change anyone's mind. Everybody kind of everyone leaves the door the way they uh, go into the door. But it, it it's I, I don't agree with that. I think just by talking about these things, it helps us clarify our own thought. It helps us really talk learn about you know human psychology it helps us learn about the human experience how we interact with the with the universe so honestly i i, I found that this book going through this cross-examination process that you just described i found this to be the most rewarding and difficult of, of all of the ciceronian treatises that i've i've dealt with um it, it's uh because and the reason is because you are forced to contend with ideas that you may might have an aversion to, but it it kind of helps you clarify your own you know thought, and you don't really understand everything until you get to the end and you really start to to, to think about it. Um, you know, I I, I think that um, I think this each book really lays out a very very good articulation of each philosophy, and there's there are some there are some passages of real real beauty in, in book two uh, in, in, in the Stoic uh, conception where he really talked about um, you know the the movement of the, the wandering stars uh, the planets obviously um, you know down to the the actual corporeal level of the human body the operation of the throat and the the 
the ears and the nose and and the argument Balbus basically says that there this all had to be done for a purpose there must be some purpose we were endowed with reason and we must have used it for, so it's a very in many ways it's a very it's a very comforting it's a very beautiful conception and it really makes you wonder um you know some people have, i think i've read this before there there are some people that have commented that um stoicism the ethics has a lot in common with buddhism classical buddhism and it may have even have been true we don't really know that uh you know the the, the original Stoic thinkers, uh, you know, Zeno, uh, Carneades, Chrysippus, they came from either Cyprus or or, sent, or Asia Minor. They may have had, it's possible that these ideas may have trickled out of Northern India and maybe into the Near East sometime um, in antiquity and maybe influenced the current of ideas through trade and commerce. And we don't know. We don't really know. Uh, but it's a fascinating thought. But, um, and, you know, even Epicureanism, uh, for all of its... Uh, Look, Cicero was always very careful to distinguish the philosophy from the man. He had the highest respect for Epicurus as an individual. He, he led an, ex you know, there's an old saying that uh, Epicurus, uh, Epicurus was no Epicurean. He actually led a very abstemious life. Uh, he was a, a very honorable man. He was, uh, in many ways, he was almost like, a, you know, a, a monkish, uh, he led a very monkish existence. Uh, the problem is that his philosophy really uh, could only be practiced by the very elite. I mean, the, the, the level of discipline that it would have taken to really practice Epicureanism the way it was intended is not something that the average guy can really maybe wrap his mind around. It, it, it takes a very, very high level of, of discipline. Um, That's where yeah. I think maybe you would agree. The Stoic philosophies, in that, uh, the coping mechanisms of Stoicism are pretty unparalleled, right? Those are for the average person. You know, we screw up, we lapse, you know, I'm going to have my iron discipline till about 6 p.m. And now the cupcake is calling in the other room. And so the right. stoicism has the forgiveness aspect to try and help you get past that. I, um, you're hitting some of the hot notes that I had been thinking about when I was reading, but I want to ask you about a question. Uh, and, and maybe I can read this quote that I pulled out uh, from your translation here, because you were just talking about reason, right? And and the philosophers all in the ancient world say this, but but especially Cicero says this here, uh, reason distinguishes us from animals and so on. But the, there's this amazing argument that the skeptic speaker makes. Is reason a good thing? Is it evidence that we're humans, uh, we human beings are like the God's chosen species of all the animals? And Cicero seems to say it isn't. So here's a quote. He says, so too may a grievous moral offense be committed with the aid of reason. You know, they say evil crime, right? The former path is followed by few and infrequently. This is what you're saying. While the latter route is chosen by many and often. This being the case, it would have been better that no reason at all had been given to us by the immortal gods than that it would have been given with such pernicious consequences. And my takeaway from this is Cicero seems to be saying he doesn't believe in like the insanity defense. When people commit crimes, we know we're doing it. We're calculating. I'm going to break into the museum and steal the Picasso. That's not happening like an epileptic seizure. I can only yeah. do that because of reason. And he says it's actually a, a curse on human beings. What, what did you think of that when you were translating? You no, know, I, 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 I totally agree with you, Michael. I, I found those those passages in in uh, in the third book are some of really some of the most uh, profound and I think important in the in the whole treaties because I think my view or what I think Cicero is trying to tell us and he uses a, as always he uses a, a wealth of examples from drama from poetry and from history to, to basically tell us that reason alone is not enough we need enlightened reason there it needs to be buttressed by a moral sense because I think what he's trying to tell us is that this this stoic fixation and, and in many ways there was a real aridity to stoicism arid a very detached a very pedantic uh hair splitting nature uh to stoicism it doesn't come across in this book but in some of his other books uh and on moral ends and um especially in, in postal disputation this idea that you know there are there are no degrees of virtue you're either virtuous or you're not and 
even if you study virtue for 15 years, if you do one little, you know, you, you, you could not have progressed at all. And, that, and, and this is, and I, I think this sort of pedantry, uh, this, this, this stoic uh, pedantry was something that Cicero objected to because he had to deal with the real world. He, was, he, was, he, he had to try cases, he had to deal with politics, he had to deal with negotiation. And I think what he's, this, this stoic idea of reason, and, and I think this is something that Voltaire picked up on in, in Candide, as we've talked about this idea. Well, the, there's, a, I think, where one of the, one of the characters, I think, said, boy, the, the world is so perfect, this, my nose was perfectly constructed to hold my glasses. <laughs> what kind of, what an amazing perfect world this is. And, and this was something that Voltaire mocked. And I think Cicero also uh, anticipated him in this mockery that look, reason is, is great and it's fine and it's wonderful. And it's certainly, uh, but there are a lot of evil people in the world, Michael. There are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, uh, malicious, vindictive uh, uh, dictators in, in, um, in Roman history and consuls who are bloodthirsty tyrants uh, who, um, slaughtered their opponents and um, frankly you know if how can we believe in a divine providence if these malicious horrible evil people were given the gift of reason the reality is the truth is that there is no divine providence Cotta suggests uh, and that we're on our own and then it's up to you it's up to us it's up to you and I to use our reason in a moral um socially responsible way to honor the gods. Because as Cicero says, as you remember, and we've talked about this, no man ever gave credit to the gods for being a good man. No no one ever woke up and said, boy, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a virtuous man. It's all because of it. No, because they know that, that, that it, virtue has to be earned by yourself. We give thanks to the gods for a bountiful harvest or maybe financial successes or successes in jobs, but just what makes it right. And I thought I thought this was a very good point that uh, no no good man ever gave thanks to the gods for for acquiring virtue. I, I thought that mattered. Yeah. Maybe maybe no, you I, think so. Absolutely, that's one of the most profound passages. Um, that one has really haunted me. It's funny. I've got a a friend who used to say the same thing in different words. He says, you know, some people say they hear voices telling them to do horrible things. Nobody ever seems to hear voices saying, "Kiss your wife, kiss your wife." Uh, right. You right. take credit for that, right? You say, no, I know I'm doing that. Um, yeah. You have two themes that I want to talk about, uh, at least briefly. One is Voltaire, which is a name that a lot of us uh, may not have even heard, or it's a name others have heard, but don't want know much about. But before we get to Voltaire, I wanted to, to get back to what you just talked about, the humor in the book. This book has hilarious moments and you would never know it with a title like On the Nature of the Gods. That's what Cicero calls it. You wouldn't know that this thing is funny. I pulled out one. Uh, but I, th there must be at least a dozen witty uh, little exchanges here. Where did it go? Let me find it. Here we go. Okay. Uh, 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 and I, here's what a little note I made to myself. You know, a lot of people, when they read this book, some people might even feel kind of blasphemous or even like they're going to go to hell for even reading this book, much less writing something like this. But Cicero not just writes this stuff. He actually makes fun of it. He makes a joke about Dionysius, the tyrant of Syracuse. This yeah. is a favorite guy. And one of the things that is in book three, Dionysius goes and robs a temple. Now, in the ancient world, that's the worst thing you could do. They call you a yeah. sacrilegus because, you know, the temples had all the treasures. So you're not only robbing the bank, but you're also robbing God. And so you get in big trouble for that. But he goes in, he robs a temple and he sails home. And he said, this is your translation. He said with a laugh, do you see, my friends, how pleasant a voyage is given by the immortal gods to men who have committed sacrilege? Yeah. Uh, and there are other cases that, you know, they've got this guy named Diagoras, the atheist. They call this oh, guy yeah. Atheos, which means the godless. That's pretty bad. And they're out at sea and, the, you know, there's a huge storm and the ship starts listing like crazy. And everybody says, let's throw the atheist overboard. And he says, look at the other ships. Do you right, think this, right. Diagoras on board, too? <laughs> right. Well, the 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 Dionysius, uh, you remember the uh, the anecdote there where he, I think he robs, a there's a cloak, apparently the one of the these temples had big statues, and there was one that had a, a cloak and a be I guess the cloak was like gold encrusted, was encrusted with gold uh, uh, overlays or jewels. And he said, "Well, it's winter, you know. He he doesn't really need this cloak, so I'm going to relieve him of this this burden. So he needs a woolen cloak. So he took the gold one off and replaced it with a woolen one. And I think also one of the gods, I think it, it may have been Apollo, had a beard, 
And he said, there's no reason for his father had, uh, which was clean shaven. So there's no reason for him to have a beard. So I'm going to remove that too. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, these are, these are humorous anecdotes, uh, but there's a real, um, I think the lesson is that, look, I think what he's trying to say is that there are many people in the world who commit foul deeds and not only do they are not punished, but they seem to prosper. Yeah. And, um, this can be very, and you know, the it's at least for me, I don't know about you, but when I got to this point in the book, I, I it, the, the, the shift in gears was, was very startling. And it was almost like Cicero got very dark. Like he got, there was a, there was, you could almost feel the, the despair, the negative, I don't not to say negativity, but you could feel the, the real uh, anguish in this, in the, why is it that my good friend was prescribed? Why is it that these, you know, how can we say that the world is governed by a divine providence when, when evil not only is not punished, it flourishes, and the good men are tossed by the wayside? And he, and look, these are pretty profound questions. It, it's the so-called problem of evil, and uh, it, it almost. Let me ask it makes you. Earth. feel like he was, yeah, really wrestling with his daughter's death, and I, I, I felt like he, I felt the, the weight of the burden of Tullia's death in these passages. Maybe, you, maybe you did too, Michael. I, I don't know. That was exactly what I wanted to, to ask you about. So you, you could mention here. You say it in the introduction, but his daughter had just died just before this. Uh, she died in childbirth. She was, I think, 32 years old. The light of his life, as you know, he extols her in all of his letters. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, so he's trying to grasp with, with I think is generally seen as one of the most difficult things in the all of human existence, the death of a child. And so he writes this book. I agree. The, the tone of three does veer into some really dark stuff here. Um, along those lines, before maybe we open it up to some questions from the audience, I wanted to ask you, a little bit about Voltaire. So just for, for some background, Voltaire, many of you may know, was sort of the greatest writer of the French Enlightenment. So you're talking about 18th century. Uh, uh, an extraordinary writer. Nobody reads much of any of his stuff today other than Candide, which is a, a magnificent um, short little uh, novel you can read. But Voltaire, and you mentioned it in here, Voltaire called this one of the two greatest books ever written. Yeah. What do you think he was getting at? Why would he say so? I mean, that that is really saying something coming from Voltaire. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Michael, I, I think that, um, you know, Voltaire, you're right. He's not read today. Uh, but I think it's only because, uh, well, he he was, as you know, as you said, he, he was a playwright, poet, philosopher, even a historian of the Enlightenment, probably one of the most influential writers uh, in European history, but it, it's, it, people would ask, well, how come we don't read any? Well, I think the answer, the reason why we don't read him today is I think because the demons that he slayed, he slayed so completely that we don't really need to contend with them anymore. I mean, remember, he, this was the uh, one that uh, he, he basically, his, his real anger was directed against the clerical establishment. He, he in his day, the influence of the church was was very very stifling, uh, in his view, and it needed to be oxygenated with a breath of reason and and fresh air. And now we can argue that the French philosophes and the age of reason, the they and there was a whole slew of these guys. They maybe went too far, and they maybe placed too much faith in reason. This is an argument that we that that students of philosophy can certainly have. But I think what attracted, in my view, I think what attracted uh, Voltaire and many of the Enlightenment thinkers like Benjamin Franklin and and um, and many others uh, was Cicero's, uh, the, the, the rationalist tone of this, of, of all of Cicero's writings, there's a very, very conscious rationalist tone. Uh, and it, this comes across in, in so many things in the book. For example, there's even derivations of words. Cicero will, in this book, he'll talk about the names of the gods. And well, this came, you know, Ceres came from the word for grain and Diana came from the word. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is, this is for the, I think the first time that I've seen in history where someone is actually using reason to actually study religion in a rationalist way. And he'll, he'll say, well, this, this God, you know, there's an, there's an analogous form of this God in Egypt. And there's, there's three different versions of Hercules. There's an Indian one. There's one, there's an Egyptian one. I mean, to, to put these types of uh, 
this type of intellectual thought in this really takes an expansive intellect, I I think. And I think that was something that that uh, Voltaire could have been attracted to. And I, I think uh, because, you know, Voltaire was not necessarily he was not an atheist. I think he did have a belief in a sort of a divine power. But beyond that, uh, I don't I don't think he really felt that he could say much about it. And I think that's really where I, I in the, the question we always come to, well, what did Cicero himself believe in? And again, we can debate this, but in my view, I think he did have a belief in a divine architect, but I think it was a platonic view that uh, placed sort of a, this demiurge, uh, universal creative force, which emanated the lesser gods, uh, which then in turn created the, the physical world. But I think beyond that, I, I, I don't think we could really say very much about it, but he certainly had a very utilitarian view of religion as a social good and a social necessity for keeping society glued and, and lubricated. Oh, so man. that's a lot of food for thought. I agree with you, by the way, I think, but, there, but these views are not shared by everyone. And, and, you know, that that's the beauty of where we can certainly reasonable minds can agree to disagree. And I think this is really where we get into studies of comparative religion, human psychology, uh, you know, but I think we can certainly say that there's been no society that I'm aware of that's ever existed without some form of religion. That's um, what Cicero says in the first few pages. He's like, how do we know the gods <laughs> exist? Well, you know, there are, you can find the, the rare atheist here or there, but pretty much anybody you've ever met, they all have an idea of the gods. Yeah. Of course, the argument gets attacked later on and so forth. Um, Anya, should we open it up to questions from the audience a little bit? While we're thinking about that, I'm going to be bringing this onto the syllabus of my Introduction to Ancient Rome course at Cornell. Uh, if I don't teach it next year, it'll definitely be the next year, so the year after. But the first iteration I get, we're going to be reading this. Fantastic job you did with it, really. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah, I found it really readable. I mean, I think that's the, the nice thing about having new translations uh, and, and the importance of having constant translators uh, and making these works stay alive by allowing them to access uh, modern readers. Now, I would like to ask a question, actually, that was submitted in advance. And uh, it was one of my readers had a bit of umbrage, took up umbrage with the fact that I had put on the nature of gods, Cicero and philosophical approaches to God. And, and they're like, oh, no, no, you can't. That's a monotheistic approach to this. But this is actually something in the book. Can we use the word God or gods when having this discussion? Michael, you want to address that or you want me to? George, you, you translated the book. Okay, That's clear. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, this is a very, very good question, Anya, and it's a very troubling question because, and I've, I've talked about this with Michael, um, Cicero almost interchangeably uses the singular and plural form of, of God. In, in, in the text, you'll find Deus, and then you'll find Di or Dei. Um, and so the question then, the, the question is, so what, are you, do you believe in a monotheism or polytheism or a mixture of both? And this is a, my answer, my response to that, and I, I talked about this in the introduction. I think there's two things we have to keep in mind with uh, when, you know, approaching this issue. I think it's perfectly acceptable to use, uh, to, to, you know, in, in the book, I'll, I'll just say in my practice, in my practice has is, is been to translate the word literally as I find it in the original Latin text. I do not impose my own uh, singularity or, or plurality on the word. I faithfully record it and let the reader decide for himself or herself how they want to to interpret that. Now, having said that, my own. I think we just need to keep in mind that in the ancient world, religion was not, this was before the age of the great monotheistic faiths. This was before the advent of, of, of Christianity, of Islam. I mean, Judaism was, was not very well known. It was confined to a very small geographic area. So the ancients did not have such a rigid view, of, a rigid drawing line between uh, monotheism and polyte polytheism as, as we do today. Yes, there is some in Egypt, things in certain historical periods were, were, were different, but they believed, I think, more in a continuum of gods, whereas there was sort of a, a panoply of, of different divine manifestations all emanating from a, a, a 
some possibly a singular source. That's one point. I think the second point is Cicero was also a um, he was a, a Platonist. I mean, he ultimately Plato was the biggest influence on him, and he may have uh, subscribed to Plato's view articulated in the the Timaeus, the uh, Plato's dialogue, where there was a an emanationist. Um, an emanationist view of, 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 of creation and of, of the physical world. In other words, you had a, 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 a divine architect, a demiurge at the top, which emanated uh, these lesser gods, uh, which in turn then created the, the, uh, the physical world. Now, this was a, you know, this is a very complicated, I'm, I'm, I'm shortening it, obviously, for, the, for our purposes here, but uh, if we see if we look upon it that way, then it almost makes no difference whether we use the singular form or the plural form, because all of the gods are essentially manifestations of the same divine essence. So I think these are the things we have to keep in mind. But it is, it is, it is. Uh, you're right. It is very disconcerting. There are some, there are some very mysterious things in this book, and I and Mike and I have talked about it. You know, the, the last sentence, for example, the, or one of the last few sentences. I mean, so the third book just uh, really tears into into stoicism and and gives the very slashing attack and then you know at the end Cicero seems to pull it all away and say well I, I listened to all three of them and I felt like the presentation by Balbus was the most close closest approximated the most closest likeness to the truth well what are we supposed to make of that I mean what what do we was this Cicero's view himself I mean what did he believe in or is he telling us that um, even though I don't really believe in the Stoic uh, cosmology and the theology, um, it's better off that we think it's true anyway because it's it's a social good. It's better that we believe in it even if it's not true. I don't know. I mean, these are I'm throwing these ideas up, and I don't think we, we may never know. Uh, but I um, I think it's something that's uh, worth thinking about and discussing. Now, uh, speaking of religion, uh, there's another good question of what was at stake for Cicero in defining the term religion and referring to religion rather than the gods? Well, we have to remember, Anya, that religion in the Roman world, and especially uh, in the Roman state, was very, very structured, was in fact a, a very, it was almost a, a component of the, the, the state. It was, it was an arm of basically the government. It was a state religion. In many ways, it was almost like Shintoism. Again, I'm, these are very crude analogies, but Shintoism under the, 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 the former Japanese imperial system uh, before 1945. Uh, so <clears throat> Cicero had the highest respect for religion as an institution. Now, whether he believed in the reality of the gods or the ultimate you know, un unknowability of, of, the, of the divine essence, so that's something we can we can talk about. I, I think we have to get comfortable. It's important for us, and I think readers of this book need to be comfortable with the idea that a, that a, a, a philosopher can believe in two different things simultaneously. He can he can have a very practical view, and, and this is this is not something that I'm I made up. But there are even medieval philosophers that that believe the same thing that they you can you can you can have. He, you can have a belief in, in religion as a social good and, and, and as a social necessity, um, and it, at the same time, probably not uh, swallow all of the theological architecture of the religion. Um, and I think profound thinkers understand that humans need myths, they need fables, they need these allegories, they need these myths to impart moral lessons they they these are these are these things survive not because the priests command them but because the people want them every time societies have tried to abolish religion or restrict it uh it's always come back stronger and this is not because and and the, the anti-religion people i think are very very short-sighted in, in this respect because they don't understand human nature and this is why no one is ever in my view no one is ever going to listen to atheists for much longer than it takes to to uh, listen to a seminar, because at the end of the day, it doesn't fulfill the human need for comfort and um, and um, bereavement during severe personal loss, uh, during anguish, during times of hardship. These 
these stories and myths and fables and rituals of religion all exist for a certain purpose. And I think the wise, the wise thinker will understand them and will, will not interfere with them. Leave them alone. Let them, let them be. Do not attack the state religion. Do not attack religion too much because when you do that, what you're doing is you're stripping, uh, you're stripping away from people the things that give meaning to their lives. And it's very cruel. So I, I think I think that's now this, he never comes out and says this, but the early Christian and I talk about this in the intro, the early Christian apologists, Lactantius, Arnobius, they they were pretty smart. They understood what Cicero was getting at. They knew they, he well, he wasn't fooling them. He wasn't fooling them at all. They knew that he didn't believe literally in the in the the, the fables of mythology, but they understood. And this is why they embraced him. I think in, in some ways the, the, the Christian fathers recognized a kindred spirit. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to get into trouble for, for, for some of these things. But <laughs> I, I think they recognized a kindred spirit when they read him. And this is why his writings um, survived and the others did not. It is it is very interesting, the, the role of religion, you know, as you mentioned in the introduction, both from Cicero saying that it needed to be upheld and, and then Benjamin Franklin as well, that they kind of had this role. And even just personally, I've been traveling through Georgia and Armenia of late last time I talked to you guys. And like, that is certainly a place where religion, Christianity in particular, is so important and was in such conflict during the Soviet Union. So it's just, it's interesting to see that these things are are ancient and uh, still relevant in our modern yeah. um, era. Um, but to switch sort of from religion to the superstitious, uh, this one's from Christian. Cicero and deviation and augury is super interesting. How would this view contrast to Caesar's? Well, um, Mike, do you want to handle that or do you want me to? The question is, how would Cicero's view contrast with Julius Caesar's? Is that right? Yeah. Well, I don't think we know much about Julius Caesar's personal views. Some people say he's an Epicurean, although that's mostly based, if I'm not mistaken, on a single speech in Sallust, who was a historian who knew Julius Caesar. But I think when you look at the historical record of what Julius Caesar did, it doesn't take much to think he was not afraid of the gods. Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. he, he seemed to have, be... Well, you mentioned Napoleon earlier there, George. I mean, Caesar was basically... You know, the same, there's the episode where uh, Caesar loots the state treasury, right? And he, the the tribunes in Rome are sacrosanct, and one stands in front of the door, and Caesar's back in the Civil War, and he says, you're not getting in over my dead body. And Caesar said, all right, we'll go with the dead body if you don't get out of the way. And so he was a man who did not seem to scruple much about the gods. No, he, uh, these I, were, yeah, these were men of action. These were not, Caesar, uh, no, Caesar had a first-rate intellect. Uh, anyone that's that's read, uh, you know, on the Gallic War can, can sense a, a very first-rate, profound intellect, but he he was not an intellectual in this in the sense of a. I mean, Cicero really devoted a significant part of his life to studying philosophy, writing about it. He really was, uh, you know, a bona fide philosopher. Caesar was more of a practical. He was a different kind of person. I mean, he was a, he was just as intelligent. Uh, if not more, uh, you know, we can debate that. But it was a different kind of. It was a. It was a very. Um, he had the the ability to assess a problem, and you, you know, craft solutions in in a matter of seconds. He could. He could see, just like just like Napoleon or a lot, a lot of other maybe Thomas Edison. He could. He could see right through to the heart of an issue, and and um, I mean, there are accounts of him dictating like four letters simultaneously. I forget where that's from but i think maybe it was plutarch that said that but he he was you know but i, I think i think how, how we have to understand cicero is is uh, and his views on divination is that uh and and religion is that he was he was first and foremost concerned with social order and stability he grew up in a time of severe social turbulence and chaos and civil you know frankly uh, civil war he himself had to flee Rome at one point in his youth, uh, where this was this was what really mattered to him, and um, he was basically a conservative individual. He was a member, even though he did not come from an aristocratic background, he was of the conservative party, um, and he felt that uh, it was the duty of, of a citizen to obey the law and to and to behave in socially responsible ways. 
Now he would, so this, I think this is how we have to come at this from a starting point. But uh, having said all that, he does have very, very, uh, what we do detect in all of his writings is a very curious, wide ranging, engaging intellect. He liked to test ideas and, and weigh them and, 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 and chew on them and, and um, sort of weigh them in the balance and, and, and uh, see how, again, he was, a, he was a, basically an eclectic and a skeptic. He thought that we should try to take from each school the ideas that we thought worked and discard the ones that that did not. Um, what, let me add one little point just on that. You know, I, I, you sparked a memory. Lucan has this poem, The Civil War. And there's an episode, it's based on history, so it's probably based on an account we don't have. The soldiers were up in the north of Italy or in southern France. And there was this old ancient forest and Caesar said, go chop down those trees. We need them for the forest." And they said, no, we can't. And they're hung with like trophies and everything. And, and they're all um, sacred. And Caesar said, all right. And took the ax and he chopped the first one down himself. He said, all right, you guys can do the rest. Yeah. Um, so that tells okay. us probably how he approached divination would be. My it point. has the ring of truth. Oh yeah. You can see that happen. Oh yeah. <laughs> now you, you were mentioning about, um, Cicero being an eclectic and I think this is really interesting because you know um, with the involvement of, of a lot of Stoic groups right now and modern Stoicism this becomes regularly sort of a, a debate when it comes to how to deal with Stoicism because there are so many popular elements and uh, of, of how to handle trauma and anxiety and anger that people really like but then when it comes to sort of dealing with the cosmology and, and some of the other structural elements of Stoicism as it was practiced back in the ancient world, you know, that doesn't make it into the Ryan Holiday books, <laughs> to be frank. Um, so, but how would Cicero feel about that? I mean, is it okay to cherry pick religion? Is it okay to, to look at Epicureanism and Stoicism and skepticism and say like, you know what, I like that element, but uh, I, can leave, I can leave the rest to the edge. Well, uh, Anya, I guess it depends on what level of a purist you are. Um, I'm sure there are people that would object to that approach and uh, feel that it uh, does a disservice to the integrity of the doctrines, which should be considered as a whole. And, there, and there's certainly much validity to that, that view, I think. But on the other hand, uh, my view is this. It's kind of like the, the, it's kind of like the professor who you know, is faced with the question, okay, well, should I recommend the Cliff Notes version of this of this novel to my students, or should I, I think you should put it all out there. I think you look, the students, they're gonna, people are gonna cherry pick no matter what you do. They're gonna read the dumbed down version of uh, Epicureanism or Stoicism. They're gonna read the pop books about Stoicism. And my feeling is, let them read. But if it helps to open the door to further treasures, who am I to, you know, so be it. That, that's always a good, the, the true seekers will always find their way to the original sources. So my my view on you is I, and I think Cicero would, would have said this because I I feel like I know him, <laughs> I feel like I know him well enough to almost <laughs> feel like I can, I can uh, maybe speak for him maybe. He would, he would have said, it's better that you start off with what you have at hand. And he, even in Cicero's day, I think he, I think, in, I think it was uh, Michael. I think it was even Tusculan Disputation. He talks about earlier, earlier attempts to convey Greek philosophy to the Roman audience. He criticizes these books as being very uh, childish and uh, very the, the same criticisms we have of the the air the airport books, the airport Stoic books, the pop light Stoic. Books. He was leveling against his predecessors. So, you know, my feeling is, hey, look. Get in there and compete. If you think you can do better, you go in there. You 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 put it out there. You you uh you put your book out there and you see what uh, what takes or doesn't take. At the end of the day, the reader will decide. The consumer will be the one to decide. And I think that um, uh, I always think that people should try to read as widely as possible, and they should read as much as they can. Uh, uh, but you know, if 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 reading a pop Stoic book helps them to, you know, to uh, to begin their educational odyssey. That's great. I think that's fantastic. If some, if, if reading the Cliff Notes version of a of Don Quixote helps, uh, or or um, 
Moby Dick. I think they should do that. I, I, I think you should read it all. I think you should. I think that uh, you have a responsibility to get up to speed uh, on as much as you can get your hands on. Yeah. Mike, would That's, you add to that? <laughs> no, I, 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 I'll back you up. I think people should go. We should read both. And I was laughing when you said that about the Tusculan disputations because I never thought about that. But yeah, he says he trashes these. <laughs> I can't the remember the names of them. They're, yeah. they're very. Yeah, you don't have that stuff. But he says read the real thing. No, I'm in agreement on that point, Anya. Now, getting into some more of the historical elements, what is the relationship between Cicero's work and the Cretius? Well, so I, I, I can speak to that if you want. There's a famous letter Cicero has where he uh, he talks about Lucretius. It's to his brother Quintus, if my memory serves. And he says, um, the guy wrote this poem. Uh, it's full of, uh, I'm not saying getting the amount of time on art. I'm trying to quote the, he says, it's full of a lot of art and a lot of intellectual brilliance, more or less. And you can't tell from the way he's phrased it, whether that's a ringing endorsement or a qualified endorsement. Um, but that's the only reference we have to him. Um, Lucretius would be familiar to a whole lot of us on this uh, call, I think, right? Because it's this this towering uh, epic poem about Lucretian, uh, about Epicurean physics, or what you would almost call metaphysics, but they don't really have that. But the big hole in that hole, and the hole is the gods. And every ancient philosophy had a systematic treatise of the gods. And so Cicero, with this work, seems to be plugging the gap a little bit there trying to come up with something that, um, you know, makes sense uh, for them. Uh, but I think that's all we can say about their own particular relationship. Yeah, my, Michael, you you know a lot more about this than I do. I mean, this is really your, you know what, well, maybe you can help me because this is something I've always wondered um, regarding Lucretia. Well, why, why is it that uh, Roman literature seems to be so silent about this like you said, this towering figure, uh, it's, it's one of the great, as you said, didactic poems in history, uh, maybe the maybe the greatest, but yet there's just very little, um, he, he seen, other writers don't don't seem to refer to it. Do you think maybe the, the manuscript was not copied or not circulated maybe uh, as widely as, or was it, was it the, was it considered so profane or so out there that, I mean, what, I, it's, it's always been kind of a mystery to me. What, what, do, you, what do you think? So I had my own pet theory. Everybody likes a good crank theory on the internet. Here it goes. So <laughs> number one, we know that people were reading Lucretius, not because they talk about it, but because all the other poets that came after have allusions and reuses of poetic phrases from Lucretius. And it's pretty clear they're coming from there. Uh, it has been argued, I thought rather ingeniously, I don't know if it's right or not, that Virgil's Aeneid was a response to Lucretius. He tried to reimpose fear of death um within uh book six of the Aeneid where there's this voyage down to the underworld and it's wow. scary as hell. but the real reason remember is that in epicureanism the the great mantra is lathe biosos which is greek for live in obscurity uh and so if wow. you're good the better the epicurean you are the less we know about you wow uh, right so the more orthodox you are this is i find it absolutely fascinating we have no idea how many people were epicureans for the very reason that's a great uh, that's a great point i i think i read somewhere recently that uh you know the in uh, herculaneum or pompeii this you know the villa of the papyri this this book i think they we know that people were reading these texts because i think a lot of the texts that have been discovered were epicurean right greek epicureans or or latin I mean, most of the writings i think are in greek uh but yet you know like you said it's it's very um these, you know, there's there's all there's a lot that we just don't know, and that's what's really so tantalizing about ancient history and literature. There's just so much that we just have to try to make inferences from. It's just incredible. But you know, we do have enough. We have a lot of whole stock stuff. That's why I'm excited that you're doing this stuff. We don't have to read the fragments in Herculaneum. We can actually read the real essays. We got them. Well, <laughs> I think I think actually that that's actually good point for us to, to finish up on because I know some of you guys have to run um, and I do want to say that this if you are interested in stoicism and epicureanism and skepticism this is it's almost like a one-stop shop to understanding a lot of it uh, which I think is just really really valuable um, especially as people are getting more and more interested in these ancient philosophies uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to you George for putting out 
uh, this this translation so people can can get even more into it and, and understand it on another level. Thank you, Anya. Thank you for having me, Michael. And uh, I just want to say, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Fontaine has been a, a very uh, continuous and uh, uh, encouraging voice of support and encouragement. And uh, I, I relied on his uh, guidance and uh, and suggestions on many a uh, at many a fork in the road. So I I want to thank him and and, and recognize his his. Um, True greatness of soul, uh, magnitudo animi, which uh, is another one of Cicero's phrases. I mean, it, it really takes a, an expansive spirit to to reach out to an unknown person, and uh, so I just want to express my gratitude to that uh, publicly here. So, and, and you also, Anya. Thank you. Thank well, you I'm going to say. Thank you, guys. Um, just as a, a little note of housekeeping, um, I'm going to send through an email with the recording for all of those who weren't able to join us live. I know we have a very international audience, and I could see some of the Australians joining us at 2 a.m. out of uh, sheer love dedication. I, I want to appre say appreciate that. Um, I will send through links to the book as well so uh, everyone can get their own copy. And for those who enjoy classical wisdom events, our next one is called The Story of Thebes. Uh, we will be looking at Thebes from a mythological, archaeological, uh, historical, literal, and military way. We've got a whole interesting panel that will be in the follow-up email as well. So everyone can join us. Uh, that's on October 11th. So we can go from the gods to Theban well, they have they had gods then too. So uh, I want to say thank you again to George and to Mike and to everybody who joined us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Real pleasure. Thank you. Ciao.